Welcome to the End Evil Podcast. This is Chris Jansen. Evil is the destruction of freedom. What does that mean? That means that we still got to talk about what evil means. That's what that means. Because it's not being recognized for what it is. It's being recognized for something other than what it is. Evil's being accepted as normal. It's being justified. It's being... Um, run through the paper mill of our society and our world and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it so many times that people forget what it is. So we have to be here reminding ourselves that, oh, we actually want a better future. We actually want to live in a world where we're all not like constantly screwing each other over and creating a situation where our children and grandchildren are getting raped by evil people, lizard people, whatever's going on behind the scenes. It might as well be lizard people, the way they're acting, these psychotic folks that think that um, morality doesn't matter, that spirituality doesn't matter, and uh, most of our society is pretty happy to just use the word spirituality only in the context of religions. That's because the jobs have been done to them, and um, sort of ultra-focus their thinking into materialism, de facto Satanism, as Mark Passio describes it, I find that to be very true. Um, Satanism is a newer term in history, but it describes uh, selfishness that goes back in time. And every um, person that talks about spirituality and history um, understands the concept of selfishness versus the concept of selflessness, which obviously can go too far. So all that being said, Today I wanted to talk about belief structures of the mind and misaligned, um, misaligned worldviews. Misaligned worldviews, belief structures, and um, thought patterns. Unhelpful and destructive thought patterns that continue to plague us and our world. Now I have this um, page here of notes that I will show you guys. I'll take some pictures of it. And uh, sometimes what I do is I take notes and notes, and then later when I get an opportunity to go through them, I put them in these uh, plastic sleeves here. Kind of a nice way to organize. Um, Hey, Marvin, if you're listening, one idea I thought of is we just basically start with a really simple book of the book, The End of All Evil, with just these. Just print it out. And um, we can just kind of at least start by um, everybody having a copy of that and then see what we can do to make a better version. Uh, the next version I thought about doing is sewing it. I've, I was looking up some information on that. So, you guys, I've got a conversation going with Marvin of Join the Internet about how to get the End of Evil book reprinted. And if anybody's interested in getting involved with that, please contact me, and I'll get you in contact with uh, Marvin, and we're going to try to create a team. And Evil Podcast, we do things like that because we care. So misaligned worldviews and um, belief and thought patterns, negative, cyclical, unnecessary thought and belief patterns. Um, I made a list here of actions that constitute religious belief and I have a slide I'm going to try to find if I can I'll get it in here if not um, I'll share it with you folks later that was from an earlier podcast I made um, podcast presentation my last presentation about um, like really you can't really tell that much difference between religion and government if you were to look at it objectively They use the same kind of uh, accoutrements, the fancy buildings, the the way they structure their meetings, the way they dress. Um, It's hard to see when you're involved with it. You've already gotten used to it, and you think of it as a good thing, whether it's politics or our systems of uh, um, control in the terms of law enforcement, right? Um, It's hard to look at it objectively when people are involved in it. They're inside the fish tank, and it's hard for them to look outside of the fish tank. So I wrote this list to help us kind of help people get out of that fish tank. Um, At least those are willing and able and interested. 
and maybe you guys can learn how to say these things in a better way, but um, I just recently discovered this page of notes, and I happened to be wanting to talk about misaligned worldviews, and it was sort of like synchronistic that I came across this um, list. So, number one, repetitive ritualistic habits done out automatically regardless of other factors. Let me read that again. Repetitive, ritualistic habits done automatically regardless of other factors. Okay, number two. Saying or repeating phrases or songs without conscience attention to the meaning or context. Um, I just added the meaning or context, but... Again, what it said is saying or repeating phrases or songs without conscious attention. Um, number three, wearing outfits or decorations for the purpose of separating by class or authority. I'll read that again. Wearing outfits or decorations or I like to call them costumes, for the purpose of separating by class or authority. And that might be or gender as well. Okay, well, we're on one, two, three. I just got dots on my notes here and now giving them numbers. Number four, using symbols, combinations of symbols to garner attention, respect, or fear. Um, I've seen in Mark Passio's work, he talks about sigils. I'm sure there's other people that describe what sigils are, but basically more complex versions of symbols that also might include letters and numbers. But, um, you know, that's combinations of symbols. Trying to garner people's attention or respect or fear using the power of symbology or symbols, um, which also archetypes come into play there. Uh, number five, gathering in crowds using team spirit to confuse or amaze individuals, to shock and awe, to shock or awe. Gathering in crowds using team spirit to confuse or amaze individuals, to uh, shock or awe, to shock and awe the, these people. Uh, team spirit, I'm just using that term. Um, maybe you know a better term to describe this, and someone can help me with this one, but I'm talking about that fervor that that crowd uh, fervor that builds when people um, gather together, and we call it mob mentality sometimes, but there's sort of this group excitement or spirit that you feel when you're in a congregation and people start getting all excited. It creates this, I'm going to call it team spirit. Anybody else has a term for that, please share. Okay, number six, displaying fake or contrived miracles to awe or mesmerize. Again, shocking people with some miracle. Displaying a fake or contrived miracle to shock, awe, or mesmerize. Number seven, trusting, using ancient text as truth, proven only by the age of the writing or the number of people in agreement to call it um, fact. So it's only fact because it's old or a bunch of people believe it or a bunch of believe, people believe it and it's old, and somehow that gives it authority. And so people trust it or use it, call it truth, just because of these things, even though it hasn't been um, redeemed or uh, corroborated in other ways. Um, that's cherry-picking truth, put that simply. Uh, number eight, claiming unique and a direct link to God. I read this list um, last night to Leslie Powers, and she had me add that one. I thought it was a very good point she made. So often in history, that's been done. People are still doing that. These are actions that constitute religious beliefs, claiming a unique and direct link to God, um, leveraging occulted knowledge. That's the big one. You know, you know something other people don't know, and rather than just helping them with giving them the knowledge or sharing it with them, you uh, instead leverage it to um, gain power over them. And um, last note here, I don't know if this is one of the bullet points, but it's a note on, on this. 
God does not need to impose authority. The will of creation is already fully inherent and present. So, there you go. That's the ultimate um, thing there. So, I'd love to um, encourage other people to join me in the conversation on these topics. I just present them and then um, open the podcast if anyone wants to uh, make comments or join me in um, a chat on these topics. And maybe we'll continue on the following week with another live roundtable on this topic. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Peace out. Hey, what's up, friends? Yeah, thanks for checking that out. Looks like I got a couple awesome people joining me already here. Got Will and Brandon. What's up, guys? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you well. What's going on, Will? What's up, my brothers? How you guys doing? I just um, rebuilt my workstation for the third time in a few months, and... um, it's a lot better, but right now it's kind of noisy with the fans on because it's hot as hell in here. So I'm going to try to keep myself muted. You guys just heard me talk for like 15 minutes, so I'm going to hand it right off. Um, Will or uh, Brandon, either of you guys want to start it off? I'd love to hear your point of view on what I just brought up. Thanks for coming, by the way. Appreciate it, guys. I'll jump in. Hey, Leslie. Um, yeah, I think that the document, the points that the tenants that you you put together, I think that was fantastic. Um, I watched the Jones Plantation uh, movie last night again for the second time and kind of really dove into the allegory. And it's a great movie. If people haven't seen it, check that out. But your tenants reminded me a lot of what they're in the movie, what they were revealing. And um you know, I always like to start with kind of the foundation of like, what is alignment, right? The definition of alignment means to arrange in a line. So logically, what's the line? When, we, when we're looking at reality on the macro level, well, the line is truth, right? The independent object, objective truth, that which has manifested currently and in the past, it's natural law. So that's what it means to be in alignment. So, of course, the social engineers having this uh, profound depths of of knowledge on the human psyche, they're going to utilize that. Um, And those tenants that you brought forward is exactly the tool sets by which they utilize to control humanity's perception because humanity is you know, ensconced in so much ignorance. They don't know what it means to be human. They don't know what nature is. They use words like God, meaning God, the word means to invoke, right? But they don't understand what that that animating principle of the all is, right? So it's these, like the last concepts I just talked about are foundational, like Young kids can understand this when you communicate to them because it is innate in in our very being, our essence, our spirit, our soul. But yet, of course, being programmed and conditioned for many, many years, uh, humanity in the aggregate has strayed from that so far that, uh, you know, we are in negative knowledge, meaning that the inversion of what we think is going on in the world how we think reality operates is so far from what actually is the truth of course many many people are out of alignment right not arranging to the truth to first principles and objective morality and simply nature which is all that it's all encompassing so those were fantastic tenets Oh man, Will, you always just blow it out of the park. I love that uh, line mint. Uh, so a line little bit mint. of co- combination of green language, and I'm sure there's um, etymological uh, etymological gold right there too as well. And well, then, you said the last phrase, the last um, part of that was mint, which means mint. mind. And I meant it. And you meant it. <laughs> I minded it. I love it. And then in Nate, and then you were talking about nature, you know in nature and then of course in nate cap of course that's also what that means no just kidding (laughs) but um let's pass it off to brandon 
and I'm, I'll turn off back my noisy fan here. Uh, Chris, hey, I can understand, man, because it's hot here, um, you know, and I got my fan blowing too. So just going to sweat it out, but it is what it is. But yeah, a, uh, a, a fantastic list. Um, some of the ones that kind of stuck out, you know, to me was the gathering of the crowd. And I like the term, the team spirit, you know, and I, um, you know, see this more as the collectivist mindset or like, you know, like the uh, group think something that we've uh, seen all throughout, um, you know, man's existence and the um, the negation of the individual and, you know, how we have been conditioned to to follow the crowd. And the crowd is extremely dangerous because it's unconscious and it is immoral. Um, it doesn't have the capacity to discern free will. <clears throat> it doesn't have the capacity to use um, 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 critical thinking. It doesn't have the capacity to discern truth and falsehood. <clears throat> and it doesn't have the capacity to discern, you know, what's moral. And we see, you know, when you gather in this crowd dynamic, people usually have the tendency to shirk personal responsibility and and uh, put it upon the group, you know, so they'll say, well, uh, you know, someone else will stand up and do what's right or, you know, someone else will, you know, help would be responsible for me. And um, this is um, this is not the correct way of doing things, because, you know, in that group dynamic, uh, it's easier to blend in. It's easier to be massed in. And we see this in the cult dynamic, too, which a lot of these um, tenants you are you know, talking about. Uh, have been used in a lot of uh, cults throughout, you know, history. Like you have the the uh, have repetitive, you know, have ritualistic uh, habits. Then you have the wearing of costumes, you know, which was used in a lot of cults and um, uh, to get them to conform. And then to uh, claiming to be a, 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 a direct or unique link to God. We see this, um, you know, we've seen this so many times and how people claim to be, you know, uh, reincarnated or a second version of Christ or, you know, you know, insert your name here, or they claim to have this certain divine knowledge that only they have and you can only get it through them. Um, and, you know, we've just seen this time and time and time and time and time again. And it's very unfortunate because you can just see these patterns that keep popping up all throughout man's history of these same, um, you know, like these same tenets that you have talked about and, and these same things that we'll have talked about and some of these, you know, main core things that most of us have been talking about, um, you know, have been shouting, you know, a hell about. And it's just sad because it's it's so easy to see, but the group dynamic um, uh, is one that really stands out to me because that's something that I see pretty much almost every day is people don't want to think for themselves. People don't want to be responsible and they want to give that personal responsibility, you know, over to an authority or a religious figure, a politician, uh, a priest, uh, a, a partner, a corporation. And deep down, um, you know, deep down, they don't really have the true self-love, the true self-worth, you know, like the true self-care to actually stand up and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be responsible for, you know, how I think I'm going to be responsible for how I feel. I'm going to be responsible for how I behave. And I'm not going to let someone else do my thinking for me because I'm going to have to pull myself out of my own problem and deal with my own trauma and fix my own problems because no one's going to be coming, you know, to save me. No one's going to be coming to rescue me, you know. So it comes down to the individual, you know, willing to uh, stop compromising and, and step up and and be that true leader um but you have to start from that internal basis you know and and um some great points um yeah and uh yeah i'll pass it on to leslie hey guys really good points so far and i want to just expand a little bit by um starting out by highlighting some of the words and themes in um those misaligned world world views um words like repetitive, ritualistic, repetitive, automatic, regardless of what's happening, regardless of truth, right? Um, again, repeating phrases without conscious attention, without context, um, purposefully dividing humans, you know, um, creating a divisions of sort of like um, false teams, 
You know, the divisions become teams that people create their identity from, right? That then continue division, right? Between people based on myths or, um, you know, stories that again are, help people feel good, but that aren't based in truth. Um, gathering in crowds, again, that whole group think pressure, using um, uh, what would you call it? Like what he says here, confuse, awe, shock, right? So you're basically manipulating people's perceptions and sensations and doing a really some, some witchcraft, you know, some trickery too, because if you can change how people feel and then you're feeding them language or words that make them feel secure, or that prey upon, you know, give them an answer to their fears, right? Then you're really putting people in somewhat of a trance. And, and then, you know, that goes on with the fake miracles, claiming stories, right? Um, trusting, like just have faith, just follow the word. You know, it doesn't matter about what you do, you, you just need to follow the word, right? There's an abdication of personal reflection, self-responsibility, because they want you to trust and believe in, right? There's distortions and that, that are being fed to people that people are then sort of sacrificing their own um, consciousness, you know, and their own thinking ability to fall into a kind of a mindless state, which is like a child state. And this is sort of like preying upon people's desire to have a savior of some sort and to defer their responsibility to have a big mommy and a big daddy. So there's so much in here. And I, I just wanted to highlight those things for now. Chris. Absolutely, thanks, Leslie. I like that you brought up witchcraft and trickery and um, the trance aspect of it, because um, that is so real. You know, I was getting a little distracted right towards the end of your because CB in the chat was saying um, the second point made me think about all the hymns we'd sing in the church, just mindlessly sing the words and didn't have a clue what they meant or the origin. And she nailed it because that's kind of, you know, I was thinking about my years in church. And I was starting to type in the chat like, you know, we would we would go at church like everybody stand up, read the litany. And then you would be like everlasting father, Lord and father. God. Everybody sit down. OK, somebody else read some shit. You know, it's like no one's like really, really. I mean, maybe some people are, but ninety nine it seems like the vast majority of people in those situations aren't really like those aren't productive, active, current in the now type phrases that they're saying at all and that was my experience even since a child and it stuck in my head is like what are these people doing anyway i don't want to go on too much with my whole life story um who are we on to uh, will you want to pop back in there yeah everyone has made fantastic points uh i mean this this document is like the playbook right and what's interesting is that you could use the same playbook but in the light you know, occult knowledge spectrum, right? There's all, there's going to be that opposite polarity where this could be utilized. Um, so, you know, context matters. What is the result? What is the action that is manifesting um, individually and collectively? So, um, and it also showcases, you know, aspects of objective reality, meaning that there are cer there's certain things in certain, a certain way that, reality in nature operates in this context how to how to mind control the population and the the individual and the population so you could use the same type of knowledge on the opposite polarity to unfuck your mind and free your mind and program your mind in the positive moral right action spectrum for a positive outcome right so it's it's very telling these these tenants and i think uh i highly recommend people you know sit with them and and go through go through all of these the repetitive ritualistic habits i mean that's a they're all huge right 
But when we're talking about programming and conditioning, it's it has to be done repetitively. And when I think about a big part of my work, obviously, is conscious parenting. Bam. If you look, if you take the, the perspective of a young child and now look at these tenants, you can see it all through culture, all through culture and, you know, through public schooling, the way parents operate with their kids, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, Tooth Fairy, daycare, um, all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, all these tenants are there. And again, what is the context? How is the, what is the effect that it is doing to an individual? What is their behavior, the outcome? And, uh, and obviously that is extremely important and telling and obvious. Right, right. Um, you know, we hear a lot of people today talking about, I identify as this, or, you know, I identify as that, you know, I identify as a Christian or I identify with, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, that communist organization. But when you look at what the etymology of the word identity is, it just means the state of being the same, you know? So when you, you know, so when you take these labels on, um, and you take on, um, you know, these, these identities, then what are you actually, you know, doing for the self? You know, what are you doing for the individual? You know, because once you take on this identity that is shaped by, you know, social engineers, um, you know, of course, you know, like through repetition and mind control and through conditioning, then you take on all of the other um, things that come along with that, you know, identity. And then that's where that group thing comes in. That's where, um, you know, that crowd mentality, you know, comes in, that cult mentality, you know, because the only thing that you should be identifying with is with the truth and morality and natural law, you know, goodness, doing what's right, doing what's moral, doing what's just, not identifying, you know, with these, um, you know, these artificial, you know, constructs that are um, there to shape our mind to, you know, you know, to, to build this artificial reality that has been, you know, constructed. And, um, you know, Leslie had brought up like the shock and awe and like the witchcraft. That's kind of what, um, you know, I was talking about with the whole dark magician when we did our one great work of warriors, um, in our last episode. And I was talking about how, you know, how when you use black magic, you know, you can use the kind of shock and awe value to get people to fall in that subconscious or unconscious, you know, help mindset to kind of get them to go along with your own evil hell agenda. Because if, if something is so shocking to the conscious mind, then the conscious mind will not be able to perceive it. So then therefore the subconscious is going to step in, then, then that's where that program is going to occur. You know, then you may go into fight, flight or freeze. And I know Leslie has talked about this a lot in her work and, uh, you know, how many of us has. But that shock and awe value, we've seen a lot. You know, this is when uh, in ancient time, you know, how the king would take someone out in, uh, in the middle of town and behead them in front of everyone else to cause fear, to get you to fall in line. And we still see that, you know, you know, today, uh, you see all of these stories of, you know, people being executed, you know, by these order followers to create this shock and, uh, you know, this shock and awe, you know, value, um, deep, you know, within ourselves, then that puts us into fear and it gets us to fall in line. You get that shock and awe, um, you know, fear when you see those uh, blue lights, you know, pull up behind you because you're like, man, I hope they're not pulling me over and it puts you in fear. So, you know, we have to break this fear condition. We have to break this shock and all condition because if not, we will always be victims to the mind control, to the dark hypnosis of the dark magicians. And then therefore, we will continue to operate on an unconscious level and we will continue to create unconsciously. And that's what the group does. The group creates unconsciously. It's an unconscious creation because it's not being consciously perceived through the higher regions of the neocortex. You know, the shock and our value is going to keep you in that animalistic state, you know, of fear, you know, so... And just some uh, some really great points. And yeah, uh, like Will said, this is a good playbook, you know, to to describe how humanity has been conditioned for eons, you know, because these things work. 
these things work, sadly, and most people don't want to learn about them. Yeah, I'm thinking back to when I came up with the idea to start this list, Brandon. Um, I was trying to remember which presentation it was. One of the presentations I put together, I um, showed some pictures of government buildings and then pictures of the inside of um, religious institutions like churches. What's up, Chris? Thanks for joining us. I'm glad you're here, man. Um, we got some so many brilliant minds here that Restream is like doesn't know what to do with it. It's it's like shutting down on the inside. But um, the point I was making is that I was trying to compare like some of the similarities to try to point out to people like I, I grew up going to churches. I spent a lot of my life inside of churches. And I've met a lot of other people that in a similar way spent more of their life like in polit politician, political spectrums. Maybe their mother was a politician. And then other people that have lived in like families that were police officers and military. And you're kind of used to it. It all seems normal. Right. And so I was looking for a way to try to draw some parallels to help people see like these things are very much the same. And that's where this list came from is thinking about the things that were the same between government and religion, uh, you know, and cultural religions and school come to think of it. They have a lot of these same things too, but we got uh, Marvin with us too. Um, Chris, you're up next. Thanks for joining us. Love to hear what you got to say on the topic. Oh, Hey. Um, yeah. I just got home from uh, doing some shopping, picking up the family that was hanging out with other people. So misaligned worldview, I didn't, I haven't heard much of what anyone's saying. Uh, so uh, um, I don't know, let's see, uh, misaligned worldviews, worldviews that are not in alignment in this, this equilibrium. So what could that mean? Um, nah, not in equilibrium with reality, with truth, obviously moral truth, the most important thing to be in alignment with, and the worldviews that result from that misalignment is a worldview, I guess that's poisoned, poison worldview, and that means it's going to affect your behavior because the mind leads to what our behaviors do, and that's the world we live in, is a world of uh, misaligned worldviews where everyone's internal reality <clears throat> reflects outwards and creates that external reality that is the support of domination and uh, the predator mindset and the support of their own enslavement and the enslavement of everyone else. I'll just stop there since uh, someone else can go and fill in some holes and I'll bounce off of that. And on it goes. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Let's pass it on to Marvin. You got hey, your audio we... work in there? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming in. Okay, coming in cool. clear. Thanks uh, for coming, brother. Yeah, no, I was uh, really happy and excited to see this live. So I set up my stuff. I didn't have it uh, set up and I was working on other stuff, but this is worth um, switching over for, for sure. So I have this, uh, what do you call these? The list, the misaligned world views on another screen here. And to be honest, I think I'm going to need to like study this on my own time, but it's a cool list. Repetitive ritualistic habits done automatically regardless of other factors or extenuating circumstances like yeah why would you keep doing that right like clearly um man i'm so curious to like hear what has people actually behave like that but uh that's a whole nother topic saying or repeating phrases or songs or written material without conscious attention to meaning and context and the moment we are existing in reality i wanted to ask you about this one chris is this your list by the way is this a uh, like, did you write? Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And it, well, before yeah. that, I want to say it came very synchronistically too. I had written like on the wall, it's actually this piece of wood right here in, in Sharpie, nice. misaligned worldviews. I had like a little brainstorm one day and then, um, and then while I was moving things around, um, restructuring my desk situation, I came across that note where I had written that and it was just like, that's what I'm looking for. That's this week's show. <laughs> so sorry about Interesting. that. Interesting. No, yeah, that's cool. Um, and I like lists like this because they help frame a topic like you guys are talking about. So I wonder what this looks like, uh, this one, though. Saying or repeating phrases or songs or written material without conscious attention to meaning 
Because I this one sounds a little like me, maybe. I pledge but, allegiance uh, to the flag. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Think about that's, culture. That's really Pop good. Pop songs, Swifties. Yeah. Oh, my you know, gosh. I mean, that's so interesting. They're okay. Spelling, yep. magic, dark magic. Okay, okay. Yeah, without thinking about, like, huh, what are these words I'm saying? And how come I'm saying that? Oh, my gosh. That's like all of us, or may, at least me, when I was a kid, for sure, and for a very long time, uh, to be honest with you. Um, okay, I get it now. Yeah, this is a pretty cool list, man. So you just found this, you said? Like you were going through a... Like yeah, um, you know, I don't know how many, how long ago. It was probably a few years ago when I wrote it, and I just popped across it, and I was like, oh, this is perfect. And I had, like I said, just been thinking about that topic. I'm like, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> I already made a list on this. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely be studying this uh, after this um call i wanted to uh, share the misaligned worldview that um i can uh, kind of see and um just as i approach life and um being parts of um different groups and uh things like that and um like as it comes to the topic of natural law for example very uh i'm new to this whole topic so if i show ignorance or nescience um educate me or help me educate myself um but I noticed like uh, there's a challenge with defining natural law uh, itself um, and even things like rights. So um, so as far as misaligned worldviews and then a group of people like us who believe in uh, freedom um, in the spiritual and uh, other senses of the word, um, maybe that becomes a thing to help people um, get into some sort of congruence with because um otherwise i've noticed groups like ours or people in general can do a lot of talking and not a lot of educating so um that might be a lot so let me know if uh, that doesn't make sense or if i can clarify anything but um that's one thing i wanted to contribute because uh some of this stuff might be simpler to like put on a list than it seems kind of like you did here like i just asked a few questions and then once i understood better yeah, this, these uh, make a lot of sense to me, actually. Um, so it's really cool. Yeah, um, like Will, Will always says, simplify the profound. You know? Yeah. And just wow. him saying yeah. that, I, I apply it to a lot of other aspects of my life as well. So it's like all of us doing this work and um, exercising our rhetoric, we're helping each other exercise and strengthening all of our word, mind, mentality, and muscles so we can have a more clarity um, when we look at the world, instead of having it obscured by perceptions, you know, is exactly what we're talking about. Um, anybody else want to wrap on that next? Uh, yeah, I have a few things. Um, I wanted to, to just highlight that consciousness occurs in the present moment. And that um, it is through self-awareness and orientation to our time and place right, in the presence, in reality, that we have our conscious, where we can be in consciousness. So that involves maintaining awareness of ourself, right, and surroundings and knowing thyself. And that includes knowing your vulnerabilities, knowing what can be exploited, you know. And so, for example, are you vulnerable because you really want security and to feel safe? Are you really vulnerable because you want to feel important and special? or feel um, connection, interconnection. And so these religious type of um, institutions, whether it's the government and your p political party, or you know, an actual religion or a group of some sort that gets you hooked in, because underneath it is a fear. You know that and so if you don't really know yourself and you're not committed to staying oriented in the present then you are vulnerable to being pulled into this kind of um, mind control sorcery and into a trance in a way and you can think of childhood games like follow the leader you know the game of everybody follow the leader or tag you're it right or um What's the other one? Simon says, you know, there's there's either like this gang attack on somebody or there's a following uh, blindly. You know, you're out if you act without Simon saying. Right. So there's this programming going on that basically is 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 training um, 
children into this outward focus of following the leader, which then is perpetuated in our political system and our religious systems, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there can be also like distractors in people's tone, you know, the, you know, watch kind of these evangelist preachers, you know, and people get hyped up, they get caught up in the hype of it, in the feeling state, in the energy that comes from large numbers of people kind of cheering and connecting their energy. And that energy is, yeah, like, you know, exploited. And people become unconscious in that, in the waves. Like that's when, I mean, people, how many times are there like um, stampedes and trampling of people? You know, people just lose their minds. So, um, so that's where some of the thoughts I had. And I wanted to just, I had a thought earlier today that's kind of relevant. And this was the, the thought is that it's like there's Satanists versus light workers in a sense was my thought. And if you're not in, you know, on the light worker team, you know, if you're not conscious of standing, you know, and stepping in the direction of truth and conscious awareness and um, morality, then you are by default helping the Satanists. You are helping the dark forces that are um, really, really taking energy from you and controlling a lot of your actions unconsciously. So beware. Yeah, I like the point about the being in the present moment and that is consciousness because what that also supports is the fact that we have a choice. Um, like every moment is a choice. And that's just something to note because like you said, um, that passive behavior that you described, I think it boils down to willful ignorance of that choice's existence. Um, and, you know, obviously modifying that is easier said than done because people are resistant to that knowledge, hence ignorance. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a good uh, good thing to drill into, in my opinion. I, I was going to say, I think it would be helpful to actually bring more examples, you know, concrete examples of some of these um, points, like repetitive ritualistic habits done automatically, regardless of mm. extenuating circumstances. How about mm. voting? You know, all this voting corruption has been, you know, very clear. And it's it's rather ridiculous to, to really think that your vote is like determining where or your taxes are being, you know, used for good things. Right. But we people automatically just get in the program and do it. Right. That's like an example. What other examples do you guys have? Yeah, one popped into my head um, when I worked at the court. It really just struck me, especially. But. Um, I've heard different people talk about it. It's like this dark occult thing with the judges wearing the black robes and then, you know, the costumes oh, yeah. that the cops wear, um, obviously military, the higher you are up in the military, the more little deals you got, little pins, you know, you got your bling, right? You know, was, what was that uh, movie when you had to have 27 pieces of bling on your, uh, <laughs> you know, Office it's like, space. Right. These awesome. I think that's one of the funniest thing is the costumes and the outfits and the decorations that intimidate because there's so many good examples of that, even in school, too. Like, you know, when you're at the graduation, you know, like everybody's got to dress up and wear those costumes again. And they're very symbolic costumes. And we've looked into some of that with with the um, hexagram and the, um, the Tesseract and all that. And the uh, 4D cube. I've talked about that. But um and that symbol is in a lot of these clothes that they wear and people don't even realize the archetypes that they're representing are archetypes of control by people that are controlling them. And if they knew that it'd be embarrassing. And I think that's partly why it's hard to realize that because you're, like I said, you're looking from the inside, but anybody else got any other good examples? Uh, can I throw one in there just real quick? It's uh, it's broad, but hopefully that's okay. Just lying in general. Um, Maybe that's, uh, let me see, where does that fit on the list? Um, I can think of a way indirectly. Claiming, claiming stories to be true that are impossible mm -hmm, to corroborate. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretending yeah, you're, okay. you have the direct perfect. link to some spiritual being, you know, and that you're the only one trusted with that information. Yes, 
Yeah. I know people like that. It's funny. Yeah. It's not funny. I, funny. I wanted to share something on the dress and costume, even subtle things like um, white collar dress code, blue collar dress. You know, I was at a job once where I, I was told to go home and change my clothes, you know, because I was a full grown adult doing professional work. Right. Or like, and I, I, even at this point, there's sort of an expectation that as a professional, I have to dress a certain way. And a part, you know, a big part of me just wants to defy that rule because that's not the basis of judging my role at what I do, you know? And I don't really need to have this separation or to be seen necessarily as this um, being that is all knowing or, you know, um, an authority, right? Um, one um, um, that I want to talk about was the holidays, you know, um, the repetitive, you know, her ritualistic, uh, you know, habits that we are all conditioned. Um, you know, we just had Father's Day pass and you see, you see majority of the people, you know, just going out and spending money or, you know, going out to eat, thinking that one particular day means more than all the other days. Um, and and I don't celebrate any of these days, but I know a lot of people do. But it's but it's just the mindset and the repetition, you know, it it is like a, a ritual because people um, you know, would do certain things at a certain time of the year and only at that time of year and it's repetition and they'll and then they'll they'll uh condition their children to, you know, to get involved and then they'll get other people to get involved in these group um, you know, in these group rituals so that's um that's one and then for the second one saying or uh saying or repeating certain phrases of songs man i've been hearing this for many many years on the softball field because i'm around kids and i just see how they'll just be you know singing songs and and it was one instance where i recognized the lyrics in a song because when i listen to music i would always go look up the lyrics you know because i was always you know interested in lyrics but i remember this this one little girl she was singing a song and she was saying like you know like kalana pins and you know like all these pills and i asked her i said do you know exactly what those were and she was like no and i was like oh man that's that's really bad and then um a lot of the parents would be playing music you know like at these tournaments and i'll go up to the parents i'm like do y'all actually go in and 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 look up the lyrics to these songs and every time they're like no and i'm like hey you know like these lyrics are are conditioning these kids and we as parents should be filtering out and vetting out these wrong um you know like these wrong dangerous lyrics because a child's mind should not be listening to certain you know to certain lyrics uh, so that's something that, you know, that I've seen many, many times throughout my umpiring career. And sadly, it's like, it's like the parents just seem to not care. And I'm the, and I'm the one person who doesn't have kids and I'm the one who does care. And, and I'm like, you know, we need to be paying more conscious awareness to, you know, like the environment we raised our kids in. And, you know, and I know this is something that Will's been hammering about for, you know, for years and years and years. And he's going to keep hammering on about it because it is an important thing. You know, the environment that we raise our kids in is 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 tremendously important. And these songs and the entertainment and, and everything that we put in front of our kids has value. And it can also have, you know, detriment too. So yeah, just something that I wanted to bring about because the lyrics, man. Well that grammar. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the holiday thing. Just was it like two days ago, Leslie and I were talking about holidays because we were trying to figure out what Juneteenth was. I didn't even, I just <laughs> noticed. Holiday. Just Which, <laughs> you know, actually the history of that one, you know, a lot more than others, we might want to actually celebrate some aspects because it's about this like fighting for freedom thing a little bit. But um, well, I was thinking about was when I worked for the court or when I worked for the government, you know, those are the people that reap the most benefit from government holidays, you know, and those are the regular, most ritualistic days. And they celebrate all of them like Columbus Day, you know, which is this guy's like a mass murderer, racist, you know, who uh, did nothing good. You know, he, he was a pretty evil person from what I've gathered. Not so, not a day to really celebrate at all. You know, what are we celebrating? Imperialism, you know, like and anyway, it's just we were kind of talking about thinking about it. a lot of times the people who are collecting tax money 
and benefiting off of the robbery that's happening to all of us are the same ones that are benefiting from all these holidays. The rest of the Porsche Joes, you know, a lot of us got to work on those days because we can't afford to take the day off because we're not getting a fat government paycheck and we don't have, you know, all this retirement money built up, you know, so it, it's kind of like a double trick in, in that. Um, but yeah, I'll hand it on. Who wants to jump in next? Uh, isn't there a, um, isn't there like evidence that the music industry has on purpose um, implemented certain messages and uh, things like that for certain names? And aren't there ties to like the prison uh, complex, um, like an actual connection between promoting things like crime and drugs and violence and then actual um, crimes? I could be, I, I yeah. made a note to myself to do research on that uh, already, but are, isn't there actual like evidence of things like that? That would... Uh, corroborate what uh, Brandon's saying for sure, so. Yeah, especially in like the, um, I wanna say like the early 90s in the rap, you know, when um, uh, like Easy e and all that, you know, like the whole gangster rap, you know, was coming up. Um, Cause this was when, you know, like the black culture was just getting out of, you know, like the drugs from the CIA and then a lot of the dads, you, you know, were, um, put in prison for out through drugs or, um, you know, like the whole pimp culture, you know, like the whole pimp culture is something that a lot of people don't talk about from the 70s and 80s in the in the black exploitation films. So then you had the crack and the CIA. So then in the 90s, you had like the whole gangster rap, you know, because you had a lot of um, you had a lot of young men being um, um, brawl about without a strong, a strong parental male father figure, you know, so they would look toward the gang or, you know, like um, um, like the gangster rap as pretty much as that family unit. And, you know, we all know what pretty much happened you know, after that. Um, it just led to more disruption of the family, um, you know, the the derogatory and demoralization of women, you know, like calling women, um, you know, named and stuff like that. Uh, it, it led to the breakup of relationships, the breakup of families, and of course, you know, more young men in jail, and of course, more kids being raised without strong male father figures. Yeah, and now there's uh, all kinds of uh, stuff that has come out and continues to come out that just proves that entire industry is pure smoke and mirrors, which people already know. Um, like, everybody knows that, like, Hollywood is fake and all of that stuff, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know if people truly understand how much of an illusion all of um, that stuff is because people are still influenced by, you know, messaging and um visuals um and i guess that can be a good and a bad thing so i always say but in this case like in the examples you're talking about those are clearly um immoral so um um it latches on to the just general topic of like that bystander effect that i'm hearing here because um these are like behaviors that people seem to have that people who have a keen understanding of psychology can just take advantage of like believing lies or not looking into uh, things further. That's been a, a big one. That's one of the things that got me into this whole uh, darn topic because uh, I'll, I'll try to share a story here real quick if that's cool. Um, you know that Maui fire? You know how they said with the Maui fire, like um, that, you know how they didn't turn a siren on that would have warned people about uh, a fire? Like, do you guys remember uh, all of that? That was like the official story. Do you remember why, do you know why they said they didn't turn on that? Uh, Siren, like, do you recall that? Have you looked into that? This was like the official story. I'll tell you, it's okay. Uh, they said they didn't turn it on because it's really a tsunami siren. So if they had uh, turned that siren on, people would have gone um, inland, which then would have directed them to the fire. And yet nobody I know would say, oh, well, good. I don't want them to turn the siren on then if there's a freaking fire because... I'm too stupid to not walk into a fire. Like it doesn't uh, make any sense. But I had friends like share that story with me. And so just immediately that sounded weird. And I was like, huh, that seems weird. Let me look into that. And so I looked into what the siren even, even is. And it's literally like you can go on the um, government website. It's an all hazard siren. So it's literally meant to be sirens that are uh, run for any type of uh, hazard, tsunami, fire you know, alien invasion, whatever. Um, and uh, so that just seemed really odd to me. And just the fact that, you know, my own friends, my own family are just kind of parroting the 
official line, even though a little bit of critical thinking, like you just go two layers in and it doesn't make any sense. Um, it just really annoyed me actually. So, um, and it is a behavior that people seem to have, like they will just trust something at a uh, face value. It's like, uh, I don't have to listen in front of me anymore, Chris, but the, I'll just call it the just trust me clause. Um, because, uh, I mean, that is, that is what it is. People have a hard time saying no. Um, they will believe things at face value. They won't look into things further and uh, they'll bucket things like that under, oh, well, they don't want to, you know, be annoying or be impolite or something like that. Well, that's the degenerated mind that we've all been conditioned into. Yeah, into yeah, yeah. Being unthinking, uncritical. And that's like the <clears throat> whatever was being read before about, um, you know, unexamined, um, unexamined thought forms. And that's why, uh, like Socrates or whatever, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living because if you don't engage in self reflection and analyzing the things that you've been conditioned with, then you're not going to know how you're living your life is actually uh, true or right. Cause that's what we all strive for. No one wants to be wrong. And, uh, just on a side note, I'll get back to this, but, uh, uh, Mr. Host, Chris mentioned the crying Mary statues here in the, in the chat. And it's ridiculous that there's, there's all these events. And one of them is funny. If you look into it, um, I don't remember where, but, um, so she, the, the statue was bleeding or whatever. Right. So they started collecting the water and then they were drinking it. And it turns out that the, the water that was coming out of the statue was because like it was on like a terraced area and it was due to like a leaking sewer a leaking septic tank or something so people were drinking like like sewer like really like toxic sewer water and they, they thought it was holy because like it doesn't matter what the reality is all about oh, is belief this is, this is what shit, i realized right <laughs> yeah it's, it's good shit. Mm, it's holy totally water. that's something oh, i realized no. before i even got into pasio and the holy shit. Stuff. <laughs> yeah that uh you know, I realized that people will just believe whatever they want. And that's, mm. that's the way that we have been conditioned into. And so whatever the authority is, whether it's the government or whoever's popular, that's why celebrities like who gives a shit what a celebrity says, but apparently a lot of people do, even though they're not an actual authority on anything, they're just popular. So either you're popular, you're on the popularity bandwagon, you jump on that wagon and you go where other people are going go with the flow join the crowd or there's authorities and experts in whatever field that you can imagine well those are the experts so don't think about it yourself everyone's in their own silo in their own, own compartmentalized uh aspect of knowledge that they can speak about so the geologist well he talks about geology but he doesn't talk about archaeology and archaeologists and the geologists well they don't talk about medicine they just follow what the medicine authority says so everyone's an authority in their specific field and that's what the education system has inculcated into the mindset is to you specialize in your field and then you trust other people in your field so all it is is a big deception trust game it's a con game where everyone's just trusting everyone else and that's the world we live in and unfortunately that's the, the the trust aspect is something we have to live with because we can't verify everything so we trust in the general um goodwill of people or the consequences that can be applied to them if they don't do their jobs right say like uh, an elevator well do, did you verify the cables in the elevator when you got into it did you verify the mechanics no but you trust that the elevator is not going to crash and kill you because someone's supposed to do the maintenance and upkeep it but shit happens and sometimes you know the elevator goes by and people die it's rare but there's a lot of things and everyone's surrounded by trust and so trust is something that's ingrained as as uh, in our social coherence as a society and we're not considering the ramifications of the trust that we um that we give towards others in so many other areas where we can do our own thinking so some things that it's like, are we going to verify everything? We're going to verify the cables and the electronics everywhere we go in the elevator. We're just going to take the stairs because we can't verify it. Okay. It's you, you'll get a lot of exercise, but you'll probably be a tiring and it takes a lot of time to go up places when you're just going to use the stairs and you know, the building, did you verify the architecture? Is it, 
actually architecturally sound in the, the physics of the, the construction. No, so we trust that it was and that there were inspectors that inspected it. And there's, inspe there's buildings that are built on subpar concrete where they try to cut corners and save money. So they try to build buildings in an inferior way. And then eventually down the line, there's a collapse. And then they say like, oh, well, look, the concrete wasn't done properly. And then there's all these things. So there's so much trust in everything that we put in all of our lives. And in some ways, we can't verify at all. And we do have to trust implicitly. And, you know, it'd be better if uh, we hope that there's a consequences for people who try to uh, screw other people over and misuse and abuse the trust. But in a lot of areas, it's just laziness and being conditioned into just accepting what authorities and experts say, rather than just say, well, is this true? Why is it true? And about the traditions, like that's something that, that Brandon brought up that I was thinking too. It's like, where we're conditioned into everything and we, we just do it because, well, that's the way it's been done. So this is your birthday and this is a special day. So you got to celebrate and then you got to give gifts. So when it's someone else's birthday, you got to give them gifts. So why you could give a gift on any other day. Oh, but then when it's the birthday, if you don't give a gift, then some person will become upset because they didn't get a gift on their birthday, but you could do something on another day. Why, what's the significance about specifically doing it on that day and all the holidays and everything. And, there's just so much conditioning into how to behave. And I guess I'll, I'll stop there. May I, may I chime in on that? Okay, cool. Um, Cause uh, CB, thanks for summarizing um, that point. Well, I, I got the same thing. It is hard to draw like the line on what to verify that is true. And I like the elevator uh, example, because that is a, a, an area where you have to trust that like you're not going to get screwed and the elevator will work and take you to the next level. I think there's a difference between um, trusting something like the elevator working, though, and when the government is saying the president isn't a zombie because like they're asking us not to trust our senses, you know what I mean? Or, you know, I, I think I'm kind of realizing that the difference might be that uh, the types of things that are good to verify typically are favored towards another person financially when they're asking us not to verify. Um, I, I need to try that again. But uh, for example, oh yeah, our currency is real. Um, and it, um, then they figure out ways to just siphon it over uh, to themselves. And then they tell you, oh, don't, don't worry, it's too complex for you. So just trust that we know what we're doing like there's so much that that entity now gains from you believing that um and that is just so much different like why would somebody purposely screw an elevator unless they're just jerks uh, to put it lightly you know so um so maybe that's uh, that helps to know where to draw the line uh, a little bit because it's a good point so just wanted to add that in oh just uh one minute the the, ver the elevators is because the the cables can become frayed and if they're not mm -hmm. inspected then they can become more afraid and then eventually they're just going to break. And then that's when you have accidents or true, like true, a true. brake pad on a car. There's brake pads on the elevators in those emergencies. And if they're not, you know, if they're so there, there's always this implicit yep. trust. And of course, in government, you know, there's things before your eyes and you see things happen and they're like, no, no, don't trust your eyes. Don't trust your ears. Just we're the yep. authority. So just yep. accept what we say. Cool. You know, and that is part of the argument that statists will state is that they think, oh, well, that's why we need, that's why we need the state. That's why we need laws, the government to enforce rules and regulations so that people keep up the <laughs> elevators and the roads or whatever, you know, but we can see obviously so many cases where those things haven't been done uh, properly up to par. And, um, but there is a certain trust, like you're saying that we have and. And I think it's a good question I was asking in the chat. And that's kind of what Martin's beginning to explore. How do we discern then? Um, but I thought this is really good because the one line I put was trusting or using ancient as a means of authentication. And that's really common. It's a logical fallacy. I don't know how many people in the modern vernacular know what I'm talking about when I'm saying logical fallacy. But, you know, it is a logical fallacy to, to think something's true just because a lot of other people think it be true or just because it seems like it's been true for a long time. 
and not enough people have argued with it. That does not make it true. And so those are fallacies in thinking. And, um, and so I think it's hard. We have to like break down so many aspects of our society and our lifestyle to kind of figure out which things am I being too trusting with and which things are okay for now and which things do we want to change as soon as possible, et cetera. And that's kind of like why we have to have these convos and keep this thing going. You know, it's not a conversation that most people out there are having and we're trying to encourage more of this type of thing. So thanks you guys who are all here for coming and um, discussing this. Um, anybody else want to jump in next and add to this convo? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, Chris and Marvin, you guys were bringing up some really good points. Um, and I want to comment to what you guys were saying, right? Because I, I totally agree. And this is why present moment awareness is important, right? Like Leslie said earlier, consciousness is about the now. Your awareness of your internal ecology and what's going on in your environment, your local environment, and even I would add the big picture as well. And I think, um, well, I'll say this first, the majority of people don't do that, right? I mean, I'm analyzing and I don't want this to sound like I'm like overly analytical. I'm very aware of everything that I'm doing, right? If I'm walking down the street, I have I'm like analyzing everything around me. It's almost, you know, second nature at this point. I'm not like super hyper focused on every single person going by, but I know if something is at a place, it it's a red flag. Just as if you were to get into an Uber and you can tell the guy is like, okay, taking you to your, your destination, looking drunk or something, right? Most people don't have this present moment awareness. Same thing with the elevator. If you get into the elevator and it, it, act, it acts funny, then you might want to hop off and say, hmm, I'll take the stairs or something like that. So there's that, that fine balance. And of course, awareness is pattern recognition. So when you think of something like government, how many times does the patterns have to show that it's based in coercion, violence, lies, deception, um, and you know before people pick up on it? But they don't. They don't pick up on this pattern recognition because they're at a low level of awareness. They are not, they don't have that balance or symbiosis of consciousness to recognize the patterns. And that goes within their own daily lives and within their own internal environment on how, what their triggers are, how they're responding to or reacting to certain situations. Um, so, and then another comment on the, um, what you were saying, Chris, about the, the trusting the ancient texts or, you know, means of, uh, um, authority or popularity. I mean, there's so many we can go through the cultural religions is, you know, one of the most obvious, but also the, the constitution for in America, right? How many mainly, you know, right leaning, um, you know, people think that our rights are derived from the Constitution, that the, the, the Constitution granted us our rights. It's t that's which is totally BS. Our rights are inherent due to our existence from nature. So um, there's there's so many. I stepped away for a bit, so I, I can't I don't know what you guys touched on for the earlier ones, um, but I, I'll, I'll leave it there. This is good. This this whole document has my wheels turning oh oh uh, <laughs> um you know from the time you wake up there's always something or someone that's trying to steal your hell awareness your focus and hell attention like literally from the time you wake up you know so when you step outside there's always you know someone a corporation government trying to steal your hell awareness your focus your you know hell attention so that's why you have to be present you know you have to be you know present in the now um and one thing that i like to do is because i am very conscientious um especially especially if i am around large groups of people uh and this is important because that way you don't fall into that group dynamic you know you have to be aware of how you think you know how you feel and how you are behaving at all times of the day especially in public you know in today's day and age with all you know with all the glitz and glamour with all you know how the shiny things with everyone looking down you know you know at their phone and one thing that i wanted to bring up is 
imagery is very powerful. It is extremely powerful. And I want to say the ancient priest class always knew this, you know, and we hear, uh, you know, the story of the graven image in the, you know, in the Bible. Well, what is a your image? You know, it is, um, it is a representation of someone or something in reality, you know? So, um, I'm sure y'all remember in the early 2000s, we, uh, you know, like we had the term, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, it's more than that. It's worth a thousand ideas in your mind because that imagery will create concepts and all of these thought forms and all of these thought patterns within your mind. And then therefore, you know, those thought forms and those thought uh, patterns will start to create, you know, like more concepts and abstractions. So the imagery is what is used a lot of the, you know, a lot of the time to bypass, you know, our conscious mind that, you know, that way, you know, how the sorcerers or, you know, the social engineers can can steer our mindsets toward, you know, however way, uh, you know, how they see fit. And we see this in, you know, like in today is everyone has their symbol. Everyone has their imagery and they have it posted right in front of your face. You can't go anywhere, you know, without seeing a corporation, a logo or a, a, a image. You even see the celebrities, you know, they have to keep their image up, you know, because it's all about it, it's all about looking good. It's all about the aesthetics. It's all about, you know, you know. It's all about the glitz and glamour. It's all about, you know, the facade, you know, the makeup. It's all about, look, it's not about the internal. It's all about the external. Therefore, to get you to bypass that truly logical, you know, conscious you know, awareness and to tap into that lower base emotional, you know, how can they, uh, you know, how can they get you to get an emotional reaction with that image? Then therefore they can sell you that idea or sell you that product or sell you whatever you don't really need. So yeah, you know, imagery has always been powerful throughout, you know, yeah. the mankind. Such good points. I have, I've kind of want to bounce off a few things that you guys have said. So one that you just mentioned, Brandon, is this idea of um, celebrities and their image. And I happened to, to just for kind of like shits and giggles and curiosity, watch this silly little video for, about a, it was by a plastic surgeon who was analyzing Madonna's face over the decades to determine approximately how many plastic surgeries she's had. And he could pretty much feel very confident, but at least like 38 surgeries you know, and possibly more. I think it might have even been more than that. It was like a high, to me, it was like a really high number. And, you know, and you can look at, at celebrities and you can see where they've just gone too far and their faces are like malformed. But, but the thing is, is that this is setting a standard for, you know, women, especially of feeling, you know, like they need to step up to this standard that's false, that's really a facade and a lie about what is beauty, you know, you know, feeling uncomfortable with aging naturally and um, this ageism, you know, that's really very prevalent in our society. So there's all of this in it. And this is like driving you uh, subconsciously, you know, and bring, bringing you to spend lots of money and obsess over things that aren't important, really. And so there's this um, automatic thinking that goes on. And when we talk about like, okay, being conscious and being conscious in the present, how aware are you of your own thoughts that you're thinking at any given moment? How often in a day do you lose time, you know, where you're like, oh shit, what was I just thinking about? I just lost like 20 minutes scrolling or like lost in my own head and ruminating and worrying. Um, driving hypnosis, having songs stuck in your head. I think many of uh, many people are living very unconsciously with these repetitive things that are coming up from the subconscious. They're not controlling it. And then they don't know how to control those mental processes when they get out of control. So when something happens, you know, a false flag event, you know, a scamdemic, it then um, hijacks their, the mind that the, because they're sleeping you know, and they're in this automatic subconscious state, and then it hijacks that and amplifies it. And so now we have, you know, like, multiplied um, anxiety disorders and people who are feeling out of control of their own, you know, daily thinking, 
okay, and feeling states. So there's that. And then I was thinking about the holiday thing. And the example that came to my mind was like St. Patty's Day and how, you know, people are just automatically going through a ritualized um, celebration that without even really knowing the truth about what the creation of that holiday was and that this St. Patty, Patrick wasn't really a good guy, but people like green beer and they like an excuse to go out and eat and drink a lot and get rowdy. And, um, you know, and so then you add the whole element of, of substance abuse, of alcohol, of, you know, social, like you were saying, Brandon, about going out in social events, that there is a need to, really to be vigilant and to be careful what energy you're around, what places you are at. You know, I've been, I've, I've dated musicians and I've been in bars and I've seen bar fights break out and ridiculous behaviors and people punch each other in the nose. And, you know, it's like craziness. Right. And so that's part of one of the outcomes, I think, of, um, you know, this unconscious sort of um, miss, you know, these tricks that, that are Chris talked about. And that's leveraging occulted knowledge. That's like, you know, doing un these, you know, if you think about marketing, even in basic like sales, you know, if you want to go in the most simple level, not look at the whole deeper levels of the dark occultist, um, you know, kind of uh, mind control, it's leveraging people's unconscious. So there's a naivete here. And the biggest naivete is trusting the government. It's trusting that these people you're voting for are actually looking out for your best interests, trusting your doctors. Um, there's a naivete and this actual um, like childlike mindset. And there's an underestimation of the impact, you know, of the evil in the world, of the, the existence of mind control, of the trauma-based aspects of mind control. You know, that um, the movie industry, you can look at like Mark Devlin's work and you can see a lot of that uh, mind control going on in the music industry and understand the intentions behind it and how it's hooking people in very um, devious ways. Um, I wanted to mention about um, what what are some of our our skills that we can use is is that Marlon you mentioned Marvin you mentioned um, intuition right um, using your own senses trusting learning to trust yourself that what you see feel hear taste smell is real right and not this like magical kind of like fairy dust that's being, you know, put in front of you to manipulate your emotion and get you to think something else is real when it's really not. Um, we need to use our critical thinking. We need to keep our brain in balance with the right and left hemispheres and at all times, you know, which means we need to learn to regulate and manage our emotions so that they don't hijack us, you know, away from our frontal lobes and our ability to think um, and reason. And so this whole like emotional intelligence and the development of skills around self um, self regulation are really important. And um, the idea of of reputation being more powerful than a title, you know, your behavior, your alignment, do people's thoughts, feelings and actions align? Are, do they do what they say? Do they say what they what they do? You know, does that occur over time? You know, that's there's like data, real life data and observation. And that's, again, looking at what's re real and not what's the fantasy or the desire expectation in your head. So when we look at, well, you know, um, social environment, we have this need, like Chris, you were saying, this kind of catch 22 around, we have to tr trust at some point. Otherwise you end up like agoraphobic and in your house and afraid to go anywhere. And unfortunately there's way too many people that actually are like that. They are afraid to go in the grocery store. They feel unsafe walking down the street, many, many people. And so there's a complete loss of trust within your own core that's missing. And when you don't trust your own ability to think and observe and, and come to logical conclusions through the trivium process and learn what intuition is, then you're at the mercy of something external to you. And there's an emotional need to attach to that which makes you feel safe 
And that doesn't mean you are safe. So how do you determine trust? Well, I think it ultimately comes down to natural law, because if I'm going to put my trust in someone, I want to make sure that person really understands what natural law is and understands what human rights are and that they're um, committed to that, to, to the truth and to what's right. And if a person shows over time that they are committed to that, then they're are building um, up trustworthiness. And that will express in their reputation in the social world. And so I think that we need to kind of eliminate this idea of looking at experts with letters behind their name or a certain degree. I mean, a lot of these, I hear lots of stories. I talk to a lot of people and I'm hearing a lot of stories about like surgeons on your, um, that, that are like, doing surgery on your body that are also out doing some pretty immoral things out taking ketamine in the in the clubs and drinking a lot and you know like there there's stories i'm hearing that are really like putting me in doubt about trusting okay and i think that um this whole idea of what is trust how do you determine trustworthiness is an important topic so great one chris yeah yeah, there's a there's a lot there. Um, all aspects of society, um, all these ways that are we've been fractionalized, and I think the deeper layer of these belief systems are what kind of um, set the soil. It's like poison in the soil for the plants to not grow, and for all these same problems to keep popping up instead of the plants that we want. Um, so we got about five ten minutes left before I want to end the show for today. Um, let's just kind of any solution oriented um advice for the audience i'd appreciate to hear at this point um anybody want to jump in with what can people do about these misaligned worldviews and uh, i don't know if we can do anything about the misaligned face views with the madonna and those people hmm. they're misaligned <laughs> <laughs> but we can That's do fine. something about the messages they're putting up and how we receive them and um my biggest advice before i hand it off is turn off the fucking television <laughs> right, who else who's got some ideas uh I'll, I'll throw something in and tie it to uh cb's question he asked what have y'all done to help self-regulate your uh emotions and uh one thing is i think of it as i don't self-regulate my emotions necessarily because i can't do that i'll have the emotions that i have it's like an uh, automated thing that just happens like i can't really control that element but i can't choose what to do from there so the thing that I will throw into that uh, one is that I uh, take my time to think. Um, and then I think about something from as many angles as I can, from the outside, uh, inside out, and the outside in, from the perspective of like, is there something I might have done here? Um, if not, what else could it be? So it like, ends up being this little thing. And it's okay to take your time. Uh, people like feel a pressure. Um, I even can, like, you know, if you're trying to get off an airplane um, after a trip, for example, you feel that rush, like, uh, just as an example. But actually, if you can learn to take your time, because people are cool, they'll, you'll actually have a lot more freedom within that than it might seem. That's one thing that I've learned. So uh, I'll shut mm. up now. Great points. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. What all three of you just recently um, brought to my attention was, and it's something for good to, for for people to look into and and know the the brain states right. So a lot of the stuff and the tenets that we talked about, we're talking about music, watching TV, social media is a huge one. Scrolling on social media, you're in the theta brain state, and yeah, there's positive you know, effects from that creativity, meditation, relaxation, but you're also highly suggestible and, you know, mind control and the subconscious is operating heavily in, in theta where it's like receiving. So, you know, this is why the ads pop up on social media, why people are scrolling and they just consume and just buying shit and then wonder, why did I buy that? You know, you're in the theta uh, brain state versus something like beta, which is critical thinking and analytical thought. So, you know, studying those, the, the frequencies and the states for the brain, I, I think that's, there's a lot of good value there. 
Um, something that I do personally that I've applied actually for many, many years. And I like what Marvin said was, you know, take, take time, um, before you speak, take time, hold information in. And I'll give you a story. Cause I ran into an old, older gentleman at a job just recently, like three or four days ago. And we got into a f philosophical conversation. This man, it was so impressive. I was like blown away. He paused for, I think about 10, 15 seconds. And you could see him, like I'd ask a question or I would say a statement and he would just stare at me and you could tell he was thinking. And then he responded. And I was like, whoa, that, that was really mind blowing. I mean, I practiced that, but not that long and not that intently. And, but I think that is extremely powerful, right? Stop, drop and think. And that will, that will put you in a, in a beta state, um, brain state as well. Cause now you're thinking about your, the information coming in, you're thinking about what you're going to say. Um, self-regulating -re emotions, journaling is really good. Um, observe your daily habits from morning all the way to, to evening, you know, to bed, uh, even dream journaling as well. Um, but what you're doing is you're shining the conscious mind onto your patterns. So it doesn't matter. It's just your journal. No one's going to see shit, right? So you, all the negative stuff, all the positive stuff, mainly reactions, how it made you feel, how you reacted to certain situations. And you do that over time and you're going to get extreme value. And just as an intention becomes a behavior, right? Behavior becomes habit. And through, through practice, it becomes second nature, right? So you're going to do this naturally. You're going to be able to increase your pattern recognition and your awareness of your internal ecology and how you operate. And once you understand how you operate on a fundamental level, right? Mainly Fil filtration information coming in, you're filtering it with the knowledge of natural law, objective morality. These are first principles. So every bit of information or situation that you are experiencing or taking in gets filtered through first principles. Is it true? Is it moral? Is it useful? These are questions that you, you can ask yourself. And if it doesn't check off any of those questions, it's complete just, you know, negative empirical knowledge, not useful, you know, so you throw it out the window or do whatever, hold it for a little bit. But I mean, those are some of the techniques that I like to do. So simplify the profound. Thanks, Will. You know, I think too, I just wanted to point out, you know, all these wonderful people that have joined me tonight. Chris, Marvin, Brandon, Leslie, and Will um, on sh super short notice. I didn't even have the idea for this show yesterday. Um, and it just really a shows as a tribute to the minds and the thinking um, practice that you folks have done to be able to, I just threw out a topic, misaligned worldviews, you know, and you can just come on and speak succinctly and clearly on that topic. And um, I think you know, that's kind of an advertisement out there for other people listening. You got to practice to get like that. These guys have been putting in the work and that's how they're able to present the way they are today. So thanks a lot, guys, for coming. Um, any last I had more? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Um, I wanted to CB's question is a good one, right, around um, how do we manage or regulate our emotions. And I liked what um, Marvin said about, you know, we, we don't want to suppress our emotions. The goal isn't to shove them down. We, we need to feel. And so we want to become an observer or a witness to our emotions and to our automatic thoughts. And one way to cultivate this is through a meditation practice or a mindfulness practice to do mindfulness daily, to be mindful of your body state and of what's happening internally. And this will bring attention to 
internal contradictions, uh, polar polarized thoughts. You know, you may notice that you have a real, you know, critic going on in your mind, and you might notice that you have a part of you that just um, feels powerless. So when you start to develop these this awareness, then you can start to dialogue internally from that witness place, which means that you have your frontal lobes online and they're connected in, they're, 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 they're able to communicate to the limbic system and the brainstem, which is guiding the physiological responses. So in alignment, alignment. The alignment, right? And so when you are in this state, you can um, cultivate a curiosity and you can start to ask questions of yourself, of um, between these yourself and these parts to understand more about yourself and what's driving you. And through this process, you also will build what's called somatic capacity, which is a dis the ability to tolerate distress. Because when we're triggered, especially a trauma trigger, it happens often unconsciously, it happens really fast. And if we don't have our distractions, we're un often can be uncomfortable. And it's about sitting with the discomfort and not quickly doing the automatic um, feel good activities that you, you uh, want to do you know, to suppress or shut down something uncomfortable. And the more that you're able to just like tune in like this, you can see all sorts of, um, you know, things that you don't normally notice. And it's really like I, one of you were saying about slowing down. Will I think you're talking about this slowing down um, and observing and creating a little more of a gap between, you know, this automatic thought and your action, but to actually do some process of self evaluation of of what's happening before you speak before you act before you pick up that drink or whatever it is that you know is um working on you that's handling you instead of you handling it um so and i just the last thing i'll say is i think setting really small goals like micro steps so if you kind of have a sense of where you're going then you need to wind back and you need to ask yourself consciously, is this thought, is this action in alignment with that goal, that vision, that North Star? And is it taking me, you know, is it alignment with morality? And so you're consciously taking each step. You know, obviously we can't, sometimes we just want to be spontaneous and fun and all that, right? I'm not talking about being super uptight and nerdy every second, but, but definitely people don't do this enough. So we need to add that into our self as a uh, really. So we always have a certain awareness to catch ourselves from doing something. Because if we don't, you know what happens? Bad shit happens. Accidents happen. People get hurt. You know, th you do things you regret, you you know. So anything. Uh, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Who's next? Um, I think. To what y'all has said, um, we have to get back to uh, using our senses to verify things. And yes, that is correct. Uh, the senses are there for us to take in information in reality so we can correctly, um, you know, make uh, discernment and and logical, you know, you know, reasonable, you know, health decision. And that's what we have to get back to. Um, y'all imagine saying something and then someone telling you, oh, you didn't see that. Or, or imagine hearing something and someone telling you, oh, you didn't hear that. And then the, and then the person being told that just goes you know, along with that. Um, you know, we have to get back to an understanding of not just ourselves, but the objective reality. That way we can align, you know, both of those because to align yourself with objective reality is what it means to align yourself with, you know, objective truth. So the senses are the best way for us to do that. And um, that's a good way for you to be in the present moment, you know. So, um, you know, if you're in a situation and, you know, there is a lot of things going on, then, you know, you have to be able to to use discernment, you know, because, yes, there can be an overstimulation. You know, yes, there can be a lot of, you know, information that can be a, a bombardment or an overflowing, uh, you know, of those things. But it's up to you to, you know, to learn how to manage and handle and deal with that and not shy away and run away and suppress those things. So, you know, just something for, you know, something for you to think about.
that the sensors are, are are there for a reason and we have to get back to using them because a lot of people you know like just want to put a piece of technology in front of them and not use their sensors to verify things you know they want to put um what those glasses on them you know the whole virtual reality um you know and not verify things you know with the false reality you have the proxy reality so well, you know we have to get back to the correct version the accurate understanding of ourselves and reality and the senses are the correct way of us doing that i love it yep i'll just add that uh <clears throat> like everything people have been mentioning is related to the the trivium so uh input senses reflection emotional states processing putting that gap between the stimulus and the response and uh, the, the trivium is an important tool to help us in our evaluation of reality and ourselves in order to um, persist in the behavior we've, we're already engaging in or modify ourselves and choose a different path to walk down. Um, but just because you engage in the trivium process doesn't mean you're going to arrive at truth. It's a methodology to help you figure out what's true, but just because you engage in some input, do some processing and maybe some output doesn't mean that what you've attained is the truth. So there's uh, some some caveats in that to, to be to be wary of when, when we engage in this process. And uh, one of the biggest barriers is, is ourselves. One of the things that I've said a lot in some of my earlier work and articles is <clears throat> you are your own worst enemy and you judge, offend, and insult yourself by your own actions. And one of the tools that can be useful to not deceive yourself is, of course, as Chris mentioned, logical fallacies. There's cognitive biases. One of them I mentioned was the bandwagon effect. Um, learning these things, but also uh, what I've termed objective detachment. So you have to learn to detach from yourself because everything that you're going to take in as input from your senses, you're going to automatically relate it to your sense of self, your self view and your worldview. So in order, so that's going to be automatically associated with what I also call the ego personality identity construct. So since the moment you're born, all the input into your senses and the stimulus that goes into your consciousness that helps to shape who you are, especially the first like seven format of years and so your your sense of self develops you know after uh, a year old there's the the ego development and then there's the conflict of the the ego you and then the other egos and learning to cooperate and share and things like that as children grow up and so the ego and your personality develops and your identity and then we begin become attached to things all these things like traditions and culture all these birthdays and these, all these uh, other festivals and holidays and all these things we become attached to because they, we take them in and they become part of how we view ourselves in the identity we become attached to. And so my point is that objective detachment is an important tool to use to make sure that you're not blinding yourself to aspects of reality or to truths that you can reflect upon just because they might contradict something that you're attached to, that you view as part of yourself. And that's the things that we become most defensive on as well, whenever there's truth that's presented, but we're so attached to falsity, then that's one of the main problems is we have in my my like four top problems, there's consciousness, because we can be great good or great evil. And there's the problem of belief. And then there's the attachment to belief. And then there's the, the pleasure trap so we become attached to pleasure, we become attached to our ego personality identity constructs. So the attachment, you know, the attachment is attachment to desire or attachment to expectations is a, a large cause for suffering. So when we're attached to ourselves and how we think we are, or that it must be this way and we're rigid and fixed or calcified in our ego, then that can be a barrier to being able to reflect upon ourselves and reflect upon what is actually true and the information coming in from our senses such as what we read or hear and our own 
ourselves can become a barrier that prevents us from evolving and and improving our, our own lives. Absolutely. Man, someone should transcribe this, this episode. It could be a, a better than all the self-help books you see out there on the aisle, for sure. Um, was there something last you were going to say there, Will, or anybody else have something on the tip of their tongue before I close up? I was just uh, nodding. I think everyone just expressed fantastic points, man. Excellent conversation. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Yeah, you Chris, guys are awesome. I know I mentioned uh, the last time we talked on the phone that it's always cool how like we have uh, different flavors of the same thing, which I guess just speaks to the truth of it. Um, so like how I might summarize the last of everything we just talked about. I sent it in the chat, but it's the you who chooses what to do is the true you because um you know before anything there's a choice that's made so um yeah that's the initiative and the will and so let's go forward this week be conscious folks of what decisions you're making um how do you feel in your body are you the emotion or are you just recognizing the emotion because i think that's a good exercise to start off with how am i feeling where does my body feel it you know, and when you recognize those things, you realize that those things aren't you. They're things that you're able to recognize as being. <laughs> Look at that tail on Leslie's. <laughs> well, I think that's the um, show call. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. I appreciate your attendance. I think I'm going to send us out here with a little clip. Uh, I know Will has going to recognize this one. I played it one time in one of my presentations before. I called it Be a Good Man or Not. Mm -hmm. Let's check this one out. Thank you, guys. It was really fun. Yeah, good night, all. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thanks right. for coming. Love you guys, all of you. All I've right. got to love you, love you. Goodbye. I'm back soon. Take care, y'all. Appreciate right. you. Right on. And here we go. It seems I've lost my religion. I've got no stock in religion. Is it yeah. playing? Yes. It seems. So. Yep. I've lost my religion. I put no stock in religion. By the word religion, I've seen the lunacy of fanatics of every denomination be called the will of God. Holiness is in right action and courage on behalf of those who cannot defend themselves. And goodness. What God desires is here and here. And what you decide to do every day, you will be a good man. Or not. Come. inside of human beings, seeing in a different light, sort of like insight, blessed and dressed, even statuesque in nature, a trailblazer destroying any disclaimer, proclaiming self-liberation from the plantation foundation. I want to build monuments from scratch, blasting this crazy pain off my back, because I never predicted that we'd be so addicted, afflicted, and restricted by fear. Like a foregone conclusion, realities become that intrusion, illusion, we're losing, breeding confusion, inhaling prescriptions with lengthy descriptions, beating the weak into submission and ignoring resistance. 
Cause the circumstances enhanced by these powerful ants that plant the words I can't into the psyche, leaving pain to flourish like debris from the unfree. I want to christen absurd words by accident, subsequently flavoring this mystical diction with non-fiction chapters like broadcaster bringing L.